I'm Ray Tommaso. I'm a 1979 MFA graduate of the University of Colorado. I've been making papers since 74, which is almost 40 years now. I'm a founding member of the International Association of Hand Paper Makers and Paper Artists and headquartered in Mutant, Switzerland under Swiss Charter. I was the first president and uh, first vice president and second president of the organization. And what I'm going to show you today is how I, how I make paper, what I've taken from the last 30 years and uh, applied to the technology that I use. Um, paper making in uh, Asia was done with um, plant fiber, the bass fiber, misamatu, um, gompe, kozo. And basically using the white inner bark of the plant that draws water up and down the stem of the plant just inside the bark. So it's the white inner bark. And it's the same fiber used in tapa and in the bark papers of Mexico. The problem is that when paper making came to Europe, that was not available. What was available was rags, predominantly linen rags because linen was easier to produce. Hemp was a lower grade fiber. It was used mostly for rope and other miscellaneous objects. You know, it wasn't the quality that linen was. And third, you had cotton. Cotton was harder to process at the time because of the seed fiber. And Eli hadn't invented his gin at that time, so it was harder to get the seeds out. So it was a lot more work to process cotton than it was to take linen and ret linen. And then you process the linen. So when you're selecting a rag, you'd have a cotton rag such as this t-shirt. This is a t-shirt that I got in uh, 1991. I just wore it out. And you're looking at the printing ink here. This printing ink being uh, 20 years older is a lot easier to beat up. But still the newer t-shirts allow you, you know, they're harder inks and they create an effect like uh, sand in the paper. So it's easier just to cut that out. Also, it would, you know, if you're doing white paper, that would discolor the white paper. You can read the labels. The labels being polyester, you don't want to use those. But the label is a really indication. You know, right here it says 100% cotton in five languages, which is very helpful. And then you have to look at the back of the T-shirt. You vaguely remember the back of the T-shirt having uh, printing on it. So that would get rid of your um, requirements there. And then this t-shirt is ready for the grinder, which I'll show you in a second. Sometimes you get questionable rags. Sometimes they're labeled like this one's probably 50% polyester or better. If you don't have a label on it, you can do a burn test. And the burn test would be as simple as this. You're looking at that flame and it burns just like plastic. You see the black smoke coming off the back of it? And then when you blow it out, you look at the ash, and you feel the ash, and the ash is crispy. It has that hard little plastic feel to it, like melted plastic. And it's crunchy. When you have a, a piece of 100% cotton, like we just cut off this t-shirt and you burn it. It'll burn just about the same. A little harder to blow out.
And now, when you feel the ash, it'll just powder. It'll be a soft, powdery ash coming off of that. And that's how you determine it's a natural fiber opposed to having any polyester in it. So now you can use polyester in the fiber, but you'll have problems when you go to print it with ink. The ink won't adhere to the polyester, where the ink will adhere to the cotton or the linen or the hemp. So we've got the t-shirt. We've cut out the nameplate on the front of the t-shirt. This is an industrial shredder. And you just simply feed the t-shirt in it, and the t-shirt comes out like that. Same thing happens with a pair of blue jeans. You can feed a leg of blue jean in here and water ski into the machine. You don't get the machine, you know, you don't get anything back. So the rags would go in like that once, and then the third time, the second time, and then the third time. That was a nice seam. Basically, industrial cutter, um, in, instead of using this kind of a cutter right now, what they would have is they'd have rag sorters sitting at a bench with a side blade sticking out of the bench. They'd be pulling the rags into it, shredding them. Then they'd send the rags to a duster, which was a big wire cage that was turned to remove miscellaneous dirt and animal matter because these rags were picked up by rag pickers, which were pulled out of the streets and might have all sorts of stuff on them. We'll, we'll take about a pound, which actually is about two t-shirts, and weigh it out, because that's about what the beater will take. The beater is then filled with uh, water. Okay, basically at this point, you have a pound of rags measured out. You turn on the filtering system. This filters out miscellaneous chemicals they add to the water supply that you don't need. And the beater is filled. You turn the beater on. You take the weight off and you start adding the rags to the beater. And slowly feeding them through. And at this point, it's kind of like a steak. You know, you just feed some bite-sized pieces in. And add a little bit of weight to start reducing the rags. And what you're doing at this point is uh, beating them. Traditionally, what you would have is a set of stampers. The rags were larger chunks. If you were doing a, um, say, a commercial beater, which was doing 25 pounds, your, your pieces could be a lot larger because of the huge weight. This being a smaller laboratory beater requires smaller chunks. It really likes quarter inch size chunks. And this will beat for uh, five to six hours per pound. So you can keep track of how it beats. <coughs> it's a time weight ratio. So this would be the larger weight. You can already notice that the beater isn't bouncing as much. Some of those rags have been reduced. <coughs> the other way you can tell how the beating is going, you can listen to the sound and the pitch change will allow you to determine where the fiber is at. <coughs> That's enough of that noise. 
okay this this is a, a beater the um, 20th generation of a beater that I had built for me when I was at CU uh, it's aluminum it's a really coarse roll uh, with broad teeth that run against a set of bed teeth at about 500 RPMs in this trough. So it circulates, so the water circulates around here, goes through the roll, over the backfall, and around. And the design of the beater is such that you come up with the design for the backfall, which controls the speed, and you come up with a bed plate that designs the beating, and then the teeth on the roll and how that beats. So the commercial beater, uh, the lab beater you saw first, has thin, um, the hardest Rockwell steel that they make for the teeth. And those are um, clipped to a uh, cast iron roll. The bed plate are the same blades in the base with wood in between to absorb the shock. So that beater works a lot better on rags. This beater works a lot better if you're using recycled materials such as mat board, recycled paper. It'll do a really nice sculptural pulp. It uh, doesn't quite have the same weight that this beater has to do the pounding that you need to do. It has this hook on the back where you hang a five gallon bucket of water to increase the weight but it still doesn't have enough power. So the kickstand comes out and it has a nice holder on the back side for the kickstand. Then it has plates that fit down here to keep the pulp from coming out. And I have made several modifications to the machine. There we go. Adding uh, rubber out here to protect the uh, bearings and O-rings. And it has a cap that fits over the top to reduce the amount of pulp that gets away. But there's always going to be some pulp that manages to escape. physics of these beaters. Uh, the uh, mid feather is a shorter distance like on a track so some of the pulp moves faster because it moves around the center some of the pulp moves slower because it runs around the outside. So this is the kind of uh, situation you'd have running for uh, four to five hours to do a really good batch of pulp. Longer if you were doing something that was more like currency, you'd apply the weight slower, do it over a longer period of time, and do a really slow processing. Then toward the end of the beating cycle, I'm using a polyester, a, po um, a plastic sizing that's added to the beater. I believe this is a Hercon 70, which goes into the pulp and will set up after a couple of days in this climate. Or you could set it up immediately with about 160 degrees of temperature. So that, this sits in there and it's like a glue that you put into the uh, mix of the fibers that allows the 
fiber not to take on ink like a paper towel. You want to do that without the beater in the background. So this pulp is at the point where it's already almost finished. So then what you would do is you'd leave it running with a stick. So we were talking, uh, the internal sizing is basically added to the fiber to keep it from absorbing ink. So you can draw a straight line with a pen or a felt tip without bleed. If you didn't have sizing, it'd be water leaf. So if you had a uh, pen, it would be like a paper towel. It would just spread out because I'm using 100% cotton. It's going to spread unless you overbeat it. And you can take this stuff and beat it till it becomes a gelatin. And in the 19th century, they did that to make a substitute for horn. When they made the paper product, it would have the substitution of horn. But at the same time, it would have the consistency of jello and have something like a 30 to 40 percent shrinkage ratio. So you really have to, had to compensate for it and hold it in place. Um, starting with a vat of pure water. This is um, basically fresh, clean, Rocky Mountain water. <laughs> We're not saying it's spring water. But um, I have a set of filters back there, and I filter the city water here in Inglewood. Inglewood has a, uh, its own treatment plant. Um, just south of here, the water rates in town are uh, equivalent to Denver's and the water rates are much cheaper than Denver's. So uh, we have an unlimited supply of water for a while. Taking this vat, there's probably about four gallons of water in this vat. Um, each one of these buckets contains one pound of um, dry fiber beaten into uh, five gallons of water, which is your stock solution. To take care of the stock solution, what happens is we're using three pans to charge the vat, and then we'll add a, a pan for the um, overall um, sheet. Let me get the molds. And then you will theoretically stir this into the vat. The European method um, was basically stirring it with your hand. This method of using um, a comb or a rake is a Japanese technique that I've adopted. It just seems quicker, more efficient, and has a tendency to um, stir things a lot easier. The technique here is you have a paper mold, which is a wire screen mounted on a wood frame with wood um, ribs for support. This is a later mold with a coarse uh, wire screen underneath the fine wire screen just to give it more support, give you a more even sheet. Otherwise, you'd have rib marks at these points. The wove mold was first introduced in uh, 1756 by Watman and used to print Baskerville's type because Baskerville had these long serifs and he wanted perfect type. Prior to that point, they used a laid screen which had chain lines and everything was wrapped around the chain line and it created these um, lines going down the paper, which is aesthetically more pleasing than the stuff, but you know, printers. 
So the technique here is you have a paper mold, you have a decal. The decal works as a dam, holding the water on the screen, forcing it to drain through the wire and out the bottom. So you form the sheet. You do a dip, pull it up, do a double shake each direction, and the last shake is a down shake to set the sheet. And then you would let it drain a little bit. This solution's a little thin right now. When you go to do a stack of felts, the first three are the hardest to get off because you don't have the cushion of the sheet underneath that. You lift the decal off. If you pull the decal over and you get a water drop, that's a water drop off of the decal. It's called a Vatman's Tears. I'm theoretically at this point the Vatman. And when you're looking at old sheets of paper, you'll see these water drips. Usually it's a drip off the hand. It, there are ways to take the mold off. This one's a fairly thin one. Chances of this one coming off are very, very thin. But we pulled it off. And then out of nowhere, there's always black things that just seem to fall out of the sky. So you can pick those out of the paper. And I've added the next charge to the vat. So I stir that charge in. Still feels a little thin to me. T-shirts have a tendency to make a really soft paper. If you're taking a um, paper, the harder the rag, the newer the rag, the better quality paper you get. In the beading process, you're looking at taking a rag, and a new rag would give you a really hard fiber because it hasn't ever been wet before. And when you beat it, what happens is it becomes wet for the first time and then dries and shrinks for the first time. So you get a little more shrinkage, a little more hardness out of those first um, rags. When you're doing a, um, an old used rag, the softer the rag, the uh, softer your paper. Because the, you know, the fiber is actually worn. Some people propose using lint out of a dryer, which is broken fiber to begin with has no fiber length and uh, really you know it's like recycling toilet paper you just get a lower grade of toilet paper so theoretically the higher we get in the stack the less pressure I have to use to transfer the sheet so what's happening is all those You've beaten the fiber, the fiber, um, you're trying to beat it, to elongate it, drag it out. So when you put it in the Hollander, the, the slower, the more carefully you beat it, the longer the fiber. So you could turn an, a new rag, which new rag is term, a terminology used for cuttings from a fabric company. Somebody is making shirts, the cuttings you'd get bags and bags of cuttings and that would be a new rag. It actually never was processed other than to be fabric once and then uh, became unfabric. And it's when you're hanging out with a bunch of weavers, you're the heretic in the group because all you want to do is undo everything they've ever done. So um, you're looking at that new rag that new rag, you're trying to elongate it, so if you beat it very carefully and very slowly over a long period of time, you can make something equivalent to currency or layout paper. If you were to take the beater and you drop the roll on the beater fairly quickly, you can make blotting paper or paper towels, something really absorbent. So it's how you operate the beating process. Now historically, in Europe, they used stampers. And the stampers were designed as um, 
just basically to pound the fiber in a trough of water and just up and down motion of pounding it. What you've seen so far in the video is that I'm using a Hollander beater which was invented in 1650 to run in Holland. And Holland didn't have waterfalls which the rest of Europe had to power the stampers. When you go back to Japan or earlier in China, they actually had something that looked like a baseball bat and they just kept wailing on the stuff with a baseball bat. Some places they developed uh, you know, large hammers, wooden hammers, and they'd sit there with their mallets and just wail away on it. But the Europeans figured out they had water power for their mills and they could set up a set of stampers and just pound this. And the first set of stampers would have chisel point, then the next one would have three smaller chisel points, and the last stamper would have a flathead. So you'd have your coarse, medium, and fine grind, and you'd just be wailing away on those um, stampers. The uh, the paper mills were required to be on the outskirts of town because they had a tendency to run 24 hours a day and drive earthworms totally nuts from the vibrations and the thumping. And then uh, that was the paper they would use in the Renaissance. They also sized the paper in the Renaissance using um, gelatin. So the process was you'd form the sheets You'd press the sheets, and then you'd hang the sheets to dry. And then after they were dried, you would put them in a bunch and dip them in the gelatin sizing and let them absorb gelatin. You took them out, put them back in the press, repressed it to get the gelatin out, and you caught all the excess gelatin so the next time you sized, you could do that. Then you rehung the paper to dry. Now paper has this affinity for moisture, being cotton, Cotton has an affinity for moisture. And the process then was that the paper would breathe and exhale moisture. And when it breathed, it would pull the gelatin in. And when it exhaled, it'd move a little bit. And it kept pulling the sizing into the paper to harden the paper. During the Renaissance, they used a harder size because they were the fashion of the day was parchment. And they were trying to emulate parchment. After the 15, uh, at the turn of the century in 1500, they got away from the parchment sizing that, you know, the heavy sizing that the scribes would use for parchment. It became more fashionable to make a softer quality paper for letterpress printing and for engravings. So the paper got a little bit softer. So the quality of the paper dropped slightly. Then other advantages came along. There was um, a quick printer of the day in Germany that printed all the scientific tasks like bacon. The English found this guy and he was the quick printer of the day. So they went and had all their scientific books printed by this guy. And what a friend of mine and I have determined, Peter Thomas, who will be doing the presentation, is that what they were doing was they were putting gelatin in the vat to gelatin size the paper when they made it. And when you put the gelatin sizing on it, to harden the gelatin sizing so it just didn't, when the paper got wet, just didn't disappear, where you were using either formaldehyde or alum. Alum is a neutral until it goes into water and then it becomes an acid. So you're introducing a little time bomb into your paper. You're introducing the acid factor. And most of the mills at the time were using hard water, limestone-based water that was coming out of um, caves. Uh, uh, Wokey Hole in England is a limestone cave with the river Styx flowing out of it, which I think is really cool. And they had a paper mill. They started in the 1600s. France, they were all high up in the mountains, all pure water. In Spain, there's a valley um, in Capilatus, which is just outside of Barcelona. 
and every paper mill in this valley is just located downstream from the next paper mill up. And it was hard limestone uh, water. So you have the lime in the water, which is preventing this from taking on the sulfur dioxide in the air, which when mixed with water becomes sulfuric acid, which is why marble deteriorates outside. In front of buildings are melting. But if you have a buffer in the paper from a natural limestone base, that helps. To process the rags for stampers, the stampers required a softer rag. So what you would do is you'd take the rag and you would wet them and roll them into balls and let them sit in the bottom of the mill and rot. And the rotting cooked the interior part of the ball. You had to strip off the outside layers, which were discolored, and you could only use the white interior layers at that time. The problem with the paper mill at the time is you have um, one or two things could happen to it. One is a flood, which would take it out, and the other is a fire. And the fire usually occurs from the regs uh, self-combusting. If you're not working fast enough and keeping up with the rags, they suddenly have a tendency to uh, burst into flame. Later they came up with the idea to process the rags a little faster. They used lime, slaked the rags down with lime. So in the basement of your mill, you would have four corners. And you'd start with pile number one, pile number two, and three and four. So when pile number one got ready, you, that would go upstairs to the stampers and be stamped. Pile two got moved to pile one corner, three to two, and four to three. And they would slake it down and turn the pile and start a new pile in corner four. So there was this rotation. You knew which pile was about to burst into flames. So they used lime. Later they came up with a big boiler system where they would boil the rags with lime to make them easier to beat. So it was the cooking process, very similar to what they were doing in Japan, where you strip that white bark, use the bark and the pith to fuel the fire, to cook, the, to cook them, and then you use a hard ash from another uh, source to put in the pot to make a cooking solution to reduce your fiber length to make it easier to beat. The other thing about cotton is it's 98% pure cellulose, and that's what you're going for when you're making a sheet of paper. If, um, as things progressed, uh, I think Sir Joshua Herschel invented chlorine bleach in uh, 1780s. The process then was no one figured out that you had to remove the bleach. You just bleached it, it was white, and you could make uh, you know, white paper. John Murray in his text on um, paper making in 1824 stated that they needed to figure this out because there were people that had set, you know, printed a Bible. The Bible lasted five years before it turned to powder and just disappeared because the chlorine bleach would then be activated again every time the book was introduced to a humid situation and the paper, the moisture moved through the book again. So the paper would be breathing and chlorine would take apart, you know. And when you're looking at the book, at that point, the book is all handset type, hand printed. So there's a lot of work to only last five years. Sometimes you need to fill holes. You have a chunk of something that's non-describable. <laughs> Sometimes they move a little. So that was a further deterioration of the quality of um, paper. Uh, the invention of the cotton gin and using cotton uh, was another deterioration in the quality of paper, basically because linen has barbs all the way around the fiber and has more 
points that intersect and you have more hydrogen bondings taking place and more ion bondings taking place. And that's why all the ledger papers in the late 1900, 1800s basically were linen ledger papers. So you could write on them with a uh, pen and then uh, if you'd made a mistake and you're at adding and subtracting, you could take out your pen knife and just scratch off the number and write a new number in. You know, it's, it was really good paper. And that's still why U.S. currency is made with linen. And they add cotton to it. I think the uh, formula, if I remember, is 25% linen, 75% cotton. Cotton is used to make it opaque. The linen is uh, makes a really thin, you know, translucent paper. So then, um, in the 1840s, well, actually, about 1820, there were a lot of experiments using other sources of fiber to make paper. The British started um, sending their coal down to this their fleet in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean at this point, um, you know, they were using a lot of coal from Newcastle. So they needed something for cargo to send back. And they started sending back esparto, which is a grass from North Africa, and filling the holes with esparto. So the British started making esparto paper in the 40s and the 50s. <coughs> the um, problem was that there was a lot of stuff in the esparto grass that wasn't cellulose because you have a stronger cell structure. So all the hard stuff had to be released from the um, fiber, which caused pollution in the rivers. The mill I visited in Spain was still pumped in the... Um, it was um, in the 80s was still pumping their black uh, black liquor into the uh, river. <coughs> they had this little black stream coming from the mill going to the river. Traditionally, after you finish the stack of paper, you would put it into a press and press it. You can, you can dry it directly on the paper mold. It'd be a really soft sheet of paper. Once again, you're looking at those hairs those hairs stand up and snag and catch and bond. So the next step would be putting them under pressure, closing them like staples, so that when they harden, they're really hard. Traditionally, the um, presses were just boards with a long bar on it, and they'd hang weights on the end of it, which would create pressure on the thing and press them lightly. Then they'd pick up the pieces and brush them onto walls like they would in India and dry them on walls so you'd have that stucco appearance. And then they'd take an agate and burnish out, burnish the whole sheet, which is a lot of work. Um, in Europe, they came up with this process of making these huge presses out of tree trunks. And they just shaved off the part of the tree trunk they needed square and left the rest of the tree to uh, make it a lot easier. Then they went to screw presses. So you have this inclined plane, which the larger your screw, the heavier the pressure. So you could get up to like 20 tons of pressure using a screw like that. 1800 again, they invented hydraulic presses. So you could develop water pressure with pumps before they became high, you know, hydraulic fluid pumps. So what I'm going to use today is this little 100 ton hydraulic press with 30 by 40 platens, which isn't the easiest thing to open. So the next step would be put your paper in the press. Another board here. So I have this stack of paper. We'll put it in the press and press it. And to fudge, I put the rest of the paper in the press. Actually, what I need is not to close, to pump the press all the way to the bottom. So I'm putting a little filler in right now.
back, back on. And then I have these non-OSHA approved safety blocks. That you would pull out. And then close the press. The th thing I found was these uh, chain falls. They have a tendency to lock in place so you don't have a lot of slippage. That didn't work very well. So then, basically, you make sure the pump's engaged. Pump it up, and then, is there another bucket laying around over there someplace? An empty one. Yeah. Need the bucket for the catch, for the water, and then you simply pump the press up. And then eventually the water will drain out and into the bucket. So in a traditional mill, what would happen is the press would close. You would leave the paper in the press overnight. And then in the morning they'd come back, open the press, and then they'd have someone hanging the sheets to dry, cleaning the felts and the process would start over again. So the next step then after the pressing is basically taking the felts apart and looking at your paper and deciding how you're going to dry it. One way to dry it, this is a sheet we just made. You can already pick it up, lay it, and then remove the next felt. And these are down to probably 80% water right now. So they're a little tricky to move. They will stretch a little, being plastic. And I've got a wrinkle already, so let me get that wrinkle out of there. A little more to flatten it because once you don't flatten it what happens is that's just amplified higher and higher up into the stack you want to press each one directly on top of the others and you would dry them then according to the literature in the books they would be stacks of 10 sheets that were lightly pressed together and then hung to dry. But that only works if you have a traditional mill in a river valley. Here in Colorado, you have to stack more sheets. I've seen them stack single sheets in Montreal. And they're supposedly between two rivers that look more like between two great lakes. And the paper would take, you know, days to dry. Where if you did that here, it would take a matter of hours in this, you know, 10% humidity. The uh, traditional mill would, the top floor would have uh, windows with shutters on them. 
and the horsehair ropes and they would use horsehair ropes so they wouldn't stain the paper like a vegetable rope would. And then they could open and close the shutters depending on what the temperature, the humidity was that day, the amount of the air circulation, how big the wind was. And then uh, they would dry them over a period of time fairly slowly. The one mill I talked to in France, they only made linen paper during the winter because during the summer it dried too fast. So they made um, cotton paper mostly during the uh, summer months. And they had um, a newer technology instead of just the overshot uh, wheel on the side of the building. They had basically a turbine running under the building. So they'd pipe the stream through the bottom of the building powering a turbine. So we'd have this set of sheets. We theori theoretically have enough sheets there. And I lost the board. Let's see if I can get this board out of here. There we go. And this set would be enough just to press it just like this to get it to stick and to dry. And it's kind of like watercolor paper where you're painting, you're doing watercolor paper on each side of a board and you're stretching it so the board is pulling evenly against each other. So that's what you're doing with this paper. Is you're pressing one sheet to the next sheet. And the other thing that's happened with the press, uh, I forgot to mention that when we're pressing them onto felts, this is a woolen felt. So it has that hair that reaches up and breaks the surface tension when you're pressing the mold onto it. Otherwise, you've got that surface tension. You saw that when I picked up the sheet on the mold, it would stay there and I rotated it off. So it's the hair on these woolen felts that's breaking that surface tension and transferring it to the felt. But during the process here, when we press it, we've collapsed all those surface hairs so these sheets will not stick together. They will not laminate. If we were to make a sheet, put a sheet directly on top of the other one, we could make a two-ply paper and then a three-ply paper and a four-ply paper and we could make cardboard or mat board this way, just building up sheets. But once we've pressed it, that won't work. Also, if we just stood on this with a board on top of it, using our body weight, we get about three pounds per square inch. Then we could brush it onto a wall and it would stick to the wall and dry on the wall or dry it on a sheet of masonite. And we could dry it that way. So we could eliminate the press, we just get a little softer paper. So this then will go onto a screen and dry. Let me get a screen, just a sec. So then this would go onto this screen and dry. And then that would slide back into the drying rack and we'll have air dried paper. Last week I had a, an order for 400 business cards. That, these were done 24 up at a time. Keeping track of the camera there. These were press, pressed in piles of 12. So they're really hard and you just kind of bend them back and forth and separate them. So they just start separating like this and you have these individual air dried cards. So that's what air drying looks like. You have this nice bumpy surface. Some of that is from the air. But since we dried them in little stacks like this, they dried relatively flat. Now if you wanted to get them absolutely flat, what we have over here is a drying press. And this drying press is set up to work with this squirrel cage blower. 
And this is set up with linters or uh, blotters in between sheets of cardboard. Those are then uh, dealing with this blower. The squirrel cage pressurizes the box. The box has an opening on the suppressed side. The pressurized air then escapes by going through the corrugation and coming out this side of the press. So on this should be the first sheets. So when you dry them this way, they'll dry flatter and you'll have less surface texture than you will if you air dried. Now one other thing you can do, you can dry those on a, a plate that has a texture such as this grid. And this would be the grid texture from air drying on that grid. Is that getting enough light? It's got too much light. So it's fine. We'll get it. Okay. So those are the uh, ways to dry it. So after after the little tour you've had of the shop today. Um, you can see that what I've looked at as I've read probably five to six hundred volumes of you know books and various other text. I've investigated you know historical sites. One of my favorite was the Bibliothèque in Belgium. They let us into the basement and handed us these fourteenth uh, and 13th century books and allowed us to actually put our hands on the pages, which is what paper makers really want to do is they want to feel that paper. And that was the period when paper was the best period. The paper at that point was made heavily sized to the fashion of the day, which was the gelatin sized paper. So when you're making paper, you want to look at historical examples. This one is 1409. I picked that one up in Paris. This one is um, 1430. It's a little finer. It has a nice rattle to it. This one has a different type of rattle to it. It's denser. It's a little heavier. And these were not made for letterpress printing. These were made for calligraphers. This one is um, 1434. This shows you what the calligraphy would have looked at like at the day. And it also has that nice rattle to it. And that's what the sound of the paper should have. It should have that rattle, that stiffness, even after a mere, what is that, 500 years? It should still sound like that. It should still have that feel, that texture that smoothness to it. So that is what I'm aiming for. Even in my sculptural pieces, the pieces are cast. They're designed to be hard, resilient, and sometimes if you move them wrong, they remove skin. If you get too close to them when they're moving, they will remove skin. They're that tough. It's, it's the strength of the material. It's what you're looking at. It's the historical purpose of people being able to make paper mache houses in England, put them on a steamship and ship them to Australia and build a village out of them and have that kind of strength. The strength of those locomotive wheels being just wheat paste and paper and lasting 300,000 miles or being able to build a paper boat and put a steam engine in it and sail it from New England down to Miami and sell it. You know, it's that kind of strength that you're looking for in the paper. Or based on a Japanese, the Japanese culture, which is stone, paper, and wood. 
you know, everything that isn't stone or paper or wood, you know, there's a little bit of metal involved, but most of the houses are, you know, a stone foundation, something to set the wood on, and then to infill the wood with paper. It's, a, you know, if you just look at life, what it would be like without paper. <laughs>